Okay. Hello, friends. How are you all? It's great to have you here. Sorry about a little bit of mucking around at the beginning there. We had a couple of technical issues, which is always the sign of a good show, I think. Um, you may note that I am not Calc. In fact, I am a San, and I will be playing the role of Calc today. Uh, Calc will be back next time, no doubt. Um, but you're stuck with me for today as we're covering a topic that is particularly close to my heart, of great interest to me, and hopefully of great interest to many of you out there. Today, we're going to talk about one of my favorite subjects, Launch Key and Cubase, which go together like peas and corn these days. You may be aware, uh, Steinberg recently released Cubase 12, and with it, a brand new MIDI controller scripting mechanism with whom we work very closely uh, to ensure that from the get-go, that new scripting system was as closely integrated with Launch Key as we were able to make it. And this means that for those of you who are Cubase users, or for any other DAW user, perhaps you will have an idea of what we're talking about here, it means that we can step one step higher than the previous levels of integration that were available to Cubase users, particularly with Launch Key. Up until now, Launch Key always operated very nicely with Cubase, but it was a matter of using the Huey integration, a very, very robust and capable in implementation um, invented by Mackey, which would give you pretty good control over the basic features like your mixer, stopping and starting, of course, transport controls, um, and some things like that. But it was a universal spec, which was designed to be able to be used with, obviously, the Mackey range of controllers, um, and then made available to other manufacturers as well. And so the Launch Key Mark I, Launch Key Mark II, had a really, really great Huey control script, but if you are an Ableton user and are familiar with the level of integration you get with Launchpad and Launch Key and Ableton, obviously very closely intertwined, bi-directional feedback, um, lots of colors, the clip view and things like that, it's about bringing that level of tight integration to Cubase so that Cubase users can go one layer deeper and really get more hands-on with your workstation than perhaps you've been able to via your controller in the past. And for those of us who are Cubase users, I've been a Cubase user for many, many, many years. Um, it's really, really exciting every time we find a way to go one step further toward removing, you know, a necessary evil, but the worst musical instruments in the world being the mouse and keyboard. Um, you can do a great deal with this, but they can be a little bit stymieing of inspiration sometimes when you just want to get your hands on and make some music. So you can see here my launch key is all nicely lit up. And I'll just take us over to Cubase quickly in one second. And we can have a look. I thought what I would do is take us through a general overview, um, give you some insight into what these features really are and what they mean, and then give you that overview in the context of um, a real live project, which is the music that you can hear playing gently in the background there, and then open up a new project and use those tools to throw together a little bit of a musical idea as quickly as we can. So I hope you find this interesting, and I would encourage you to, if you are a uh, Cubase user, then to seriously investigate this implementation with the new launch key, because it's wonderful. And if you're not completely loyal to your existing workstation, but you're a, a launch key owner, and thinking of exploring other workstation options out there, then um, definitely worth checking out this with Cubase 12, Launch Key Mark 3. Also worth noting is that until the 20th of May this month, uh, we have a deal running with Steinberg. And if you're a Launch Key Mark 3 owner, there will be a code, I think, in your account, which will give you 10% off Cubase. Now, what makes Cubase so great? 
people tend to be very closely wedded to their workstation software. It's a deeply personal choice and I don't think there's a right or a wrong workstation software that you can use out there. Um, it can be a matter of personal tastes as well as perhaps the source of influences that you have out there. You know, if the people that you admire are using music making one particular piece of software, then you may be driven to do that as well. Um, Cubase specifically is very famous for its strength with MIDI composition. Uh, it's highly regarded in the composing world. Um, it gives you the best of all possible worlds, an immense amount of MIDI power, um, many layers deeper than just notes and controllers, obviously, as well as a really comprehensive audio recording, audio editing, multi-track system into it. So let's just take a little look at Cubase here and I'll turn up our track a little bit. You can hear what's going on. So what we've got here is an entirely MIDI composition. Um, it's made up of, I think in the project here, you can see there are 17 MIDI tracks. I'll just pop my launch key in the top right corner there. Um, I am keeping an eye on the chat, so if anybody wants to ask any questions, feel free. And so this is all put together with MIDI tracks and virtual instruments, instrument tracks. Uh, I haven't used any audio tracks in this project, um, though they will behave obviously in much the same way as the MIDI tracks. So if we start at the top, we can see we have some drums and then a bass track, a glockenspiel. Uh, if you're wondering what virtual instruments I'm using in this project, it's a real mixed bag. There is uh, some superior drummer for some drums. I'm using the SCARB bass from NI Complete for the bass line. Uh, there is a bunch of the excellent Abbey Road plugin collection from Spitfire in use, as well as some of my favorite little synth plugins like the Roland and um, one of my personal all-time favorites, G-Force's Mini Monster, which is a brilliant bass plugin and one that we gave away as part of our sound collective a little while ago. So what can we do? Straight away, I can tell you that I have got full mixer control. I'll just jump over to my keyboard here. Uh, full mixer control, so something as simple as turning my drums up and down. As simple as grabbing a fader. So very, very simple kind of functionality there, just grabbing a fader and having control over my drums level. But what I can tell you is that that functionality was there straight out of the box. I didn't have to set anything up. I just connected uh, launch key to the computer, started Cubase, and there it was. My mixer was already mapped across. Similarly, if I just go back to Cubase again and throw my keyboard in the corner, you can see here, along the top row of pads here, uh, I'll just bring the keyboard up, sorry. Along the top row of pads here, you can see these illuminated pads. Uh, I have track selection here. So if I bring the computer up and put myself in the corner, you can see I've got in Cubase there track one selected. Now track two, track three, track four, track five, six, seven, and eight. And now what happens, you may ask? I only have eight pads and eight track selection buttons. Well, I use launch keys track button and I press to the right and that will bank me over eight tracks. So now I've got the next eight tracks and you can see on Cubase here, track nine, 10, 11, 12, and so on. On to infinity. So you can just bank until the cows come home. Um, a really, really elegant, quick way to be able to navigate your project very quickly. And secondly, in addition to this, beneath the track select row here of top, uh, so the top row of pads, on the second row I have record enable. So I can bank myself all the way back, select my drums track at the top, you can see, 
and record enable or disenable as many other tracks as I like. So if I was doing a multi-track recording, it would be a simple matter of just record enabling as many of those tracks as I wanted. And then of course, being able to bank around again to navigate that. So there's this brilliant, great strength, no setup required. It's just, well, there's no other way to put it. It's easy, which when it comes down to music making is something of immense value. I can speak from my experience and I'm sure some of you have had the same, which is full of inspiration, full of vigor, sit down and crash into some technical problems. Not unlike when I started the streaming here, um, it can be a real buzzkill. So having that reliability and robustness is a wonderful thing. So it's just that simple function of navigating your track. I don't have to grab a mouse and find my way to the track that I want. If I want to play with my spiccato strings, then I just see track four on the screen here. And I'll go back to Cubase quickly, sorry. Track four on my screen I can see, so I hit pad four on my controllers and I am playing my spiccato strings. I'll turn them up a bit so we can hear it. Same for my trumpets, next track. Or my horns. So this is a profoundly quick and inspirational way to be able to fly around the project. Now, of course, this goes much further than that. Uh, if I press the stop solo mute button here on our controller, these two rows of pads here now turn into solo and mute switches. So if I get our project playing, you'll be able to see I can just start muting things out. I'll mute the drums and the bass and just work my way along muting things. And as we know, having hands-on mutes in a project is actually a great way to experiment and play around with the arrangement without slicing up and getting too dirty with the project. So I can just... play with these mutes, see which parts sound good together, what, what sounds good, you know? Maybe if I just go back to bass and drums a little. So we'll mute everything. Um, that's pretty much everything muted. And now we've got the drums. I'll just loop us up a section here so we can start to feel, get a feel for this. So bass, drums. Oh, my, my part, the section just ended, apologies. All right, so I'll throw the strings over the top. Now maybe I wanna hear what the horns are doing on their own, so I can see the horns are on track seven. Maybe I'll just solo them. So by hitting the solo pad here, and I'm sorry, there's obviously a lot of color-based feedback here, which is um, which is really, really handy and brilliant way to get around. Just disclaimer, I'm really colorblind, so I'm not gonna try and name the colors because I'm just going to embarrass myself. But I can just solo a track, have a listen to my horns. A really useful tool for locating wrong notes when you're doing a lot of MIDI composition or out of time notes maybe that are masked in the arrangement um, but are easier to hear when they're soloed so I can play with my solos and they're straight out. And I will just unmute the rest of the project. So you can see by having this feedback, when I mute a pad, it's brightly illuminated. When I unmute that track, it's dimly illuminated. Same with my track selection. If I don't know which track I've got selected and I'm not looking at my screen, then I can just look at my controller and see that pad seven is illuminated bright white here, so that's my selection. Same with track four. So I'm never running blind. Launch Key Mark Three is always telling me what's going on in the project which can be a simple case of if I have the mixer up. 
occupying the full screen in Cubase. It can sometimes be difficult to know what's going on behind the scenes. So it's really handy to have all of that feedback. You'll also note if I just go to the keyboard alone that the feedback is reflected across not just the pads here beneath the knobs, but the pads beneath the faders. So if I select track two here, you can see that is re uh, reflected here on the pads beneath the faders or the switches beneath the faders. Same five, six, seven, eight. And you can see that bi-directional feedback, that close tie-in with Cubase speaking to the controller as well as the controller speaking to Cubase. So that's a real little breakthrough control. So we have discussed uh, mute, solo, select and record arm. Really, really handy, basic, everyday meat and potatoes features. And while we're on the really, really basic handy stuff, we'll just have a quick look at a couple of others. I'll throw us in a section of the project here where there's nothing happening. So the project is playing at the moment, but it's an empty section of my timeline, which you can see on the screen there. I've just looped up a four bar section, which is going around and around. And if I go to my, or you can see it there on that view as well, um, the simplest, but probably the most useful controls, obviously a stop button, a play button. So we have total transport control, stop, play, we have a button here for the click, obviously labeled click. And there's my click track. I hope you can hear that. I, I keep my click track fairly low, but. Again, another thing saves you reaching for the mouse and the keyboard. Instant access to really, really useful everyday controls like click. Alongside it, we also have uh, the quantize control broken out onto the controller. There's something I can tell you I make use of a lot. Quantize is, uh, is my savior. Uh, if you note here on Cubase, if you can see where I'm pointing, I keep soft quantize on pretty much all the time here, this little control. And what that does is it's a kind of iterative quantize. It won't hard quantize things to the grid, but it will push them toward where they should be. And with every subsequent press, of quantize, or of, it can be Q on the keyboard or quantize on the controller, it will push it even further. So if I turn on my click here, and I'll just uh, pop my keyboard in the corner again. So I've got click on, we're going around in a four bar loop, and I will select track one, where I've got my drum track. So let's just have a look at that quantize control, for example, I'll shorten my loop so I don't have to drum out a four bar loop every time. Um, I'll also stop, hit record here, which will give me a four bar counting. And before I do that, I'll just point out, obviously play, stop, record, and next to that is loop. And if you look at my selection here on Cubase, you can see the top section is hmm, blue. I think it's blue. If I press my loop button, that goes gray, which disables the loop. So the fourth essential control along the bottom row here is the loop control being able to enable and disenable that without taking your hands away from the keyboard. Extremely, extremely handy control to have. So I'll hit my record button, get a count in. All right, we turn off record. I'll turn off the click. Well, I've got to say it's actually far from the absolute worst finger drumming I've ever done. But if I hit my quantize button, I'll just zoom in on a bit so you can see these events moving around. Okay, so I'll hit quantize. And you can see those notes move just a bit, still not entirely on the grid. If I zoom right in, we can see here that they haven't quite landed back on the grid. So what that soft quantize does is lets me retain a bunch of the human feel, something that can sometimes be quantized right out of electronic music. Perhaps you want to do that. Sometimes I want to do that too. Um, but being able to move in increments and having a hardware control and use my ears, it's that thing where it's about 
bringing the feel and the vibe of hardware tactile control to the music workstation. So I can use my ears if I just undo that quantize, we'll press it once, then we'll press quantize a couple more times to see what kind of effect that has on this. So press it once, tightens it up a bit, press it again, now we're getting really close to the grid you can hear, and I've just knock on quantize a few more times um, to really push it into the grid. So I can use the combination of my quantize and undo button to really fine tune the feel that I'm after. So if I just undo back, whoop, um, I just undid too far. I've found, because I've been using this setup quite a bit um, with the new integration, it's been a real game changer for me actually. I'm always looking for great new ways to move, to work faster and smarter, and, but more creatively with my rig. Um, by, if I just go to our view here, I often, you know, spend a bit of time, quantize, undo, whoop, I undid too far, and just playing with hitting each button a couple of times until I feel it latch into a groove that I like. So now I'll select track two, I'll bring up our Cubase, throw the keyboard in the corner, and now we have our bass track. So again, So we'll throw something down just for fun, hit record. So you can hear I obviously got a bit thingo at the end there. So great, we'll just get out of record and we'll do that. What I was talking about before, I'll hit the quantize button a couple of times so it really brings it in. Great, maybe undo one more just to keep that human feel. So it's simple, it's functional, um, and quantizing and undo, this is not groundbreaking stuff. These are, these are the kind of tools and features that we rely on every day when we're using a piece of music software. But having it right underneath my fingers when I want it within Cubase is pretty game changing for the Cubase users out there because my hands want to be on the keyboard, not going between the keyboard and the mouse. All right. So we'll kick on to a couple of the other great features. We've covered star, uh, sorry, stop, solo, mute, record enable, the transport control, the final thing on the um, in the transport section that's worth a big mention is the retrospective record function. So I will just go to a, I'll throw this up again. I'll just go to this channel which has got a piano plug-in on it. And so, okay. Now, if I liked that, I can just hit the capture MIDI button and you will see that that MIDI's just appeared out of nowhere. So if I was playing with, let's go back to this little section I looped up before. Whoops. Um, I'll just tidy that up momentarily for nice looping and play. <laughs> with parts. But I'm not recording. Right, then I found the part that I liked. I hit that capture MIDI button. And that MIDI, which I wasn't recording while I was just playing around and experimenting, has appeared on my timeline. Again, big game changer. Um, if you're anything like me, I tend to have no problem coming up with ideas until it becomes time to hit the record button and that's where everything unravels. The record button can really unravel things. So I'll just enable that. 
again do my quantize trick. So having retrospective record right there on the controller, um, sometimes it is very intentional that I find myself hitting that button because I knew I had the idea and I may not be able to, pe uh, to perform that again or I know that it's going to be problematic for whatever reason. And sometimes it's just fun to hit the button and see what's in that buffer and it can be a great source of inspiration as well. All right, so just a quick moment further on the fader control here. Um, I will just... Well, let's move the piano track up there for good measure. All right, so now I've got my piano track moved up. Drums, bass, piano. Uh, we'll throw something else down just for good measure. All right, quantize that a bit. something on my glockenspiel. All right. And so here is a brilliant feature for me, just being able to grab the faders. Sometimes you want to pull a mix and bring up the mixer, grab the mouse and start pushing around the faders. But we mix with our ears and so it can be great to have not be looking at a cursor on a screen just to be able to grab those faders and see what happens. So here we go, I've got the first four tracks of my project you can see here. I've got drums, bass, piano, glockenspiel or five tracks, I can't even count, and spiccato strings. So I'll grab those faders and bring them down and now we're pulling a whoop, now we're pulling a mix. So let's start with obviously the drums and bass. All right, now my piano. And my glockenspiel. The strings. So if I think the bass is a bit loud, I can just nudge it down a bit. So very quickly, I've been able to throw down five tracks of MIDI, get it mixed in a way that's going to sound reasonably fluid and blending nicely without taking my hands off my controller. Pretty wonderful stuff. All right, so then we'll zoom into a slightly deeper level of integration here. Um, We've covered the mutes, the solos, the track records, the transport, mixing with the faders. Now, if we hold down our shift button here, and um, I do know that, sorry, you probably cannot see these with such remarkable detail because, well, it's a long way away, but here we have our mode selection for what our knobs are going to be doing at any given time. So at the moment, you can see the second pad is illuminated, which is volume much like the controls that you would have for Ableton here, the, the labeling is already on the, uh, on the unit on launch key. The third pad is panning. And so if I just solo my drums momentarily, uh, solo my drums, yes. Okay, we should have solo drums. By changing my knobs to the pan mode, I can now use this row of knobs here to pan things. So my pans, my drums have gone hard right, my drums have gone hard left, and then if I want to go back to whatever mode, I just hold down shift and go there. So really, really, again, as a, with your volume controls being spilled out across the faders here, and your pan controls across the knobs with just a quick button press, we've pretty much got all of the basic functionality of mixing and panning covered right there. Really, really great thing to have under your fingertips without, again, going for our old friends, the keyboard and the mouse. There's another mode here, which is sends, which is the fourth mode here. So by holding down shift, pressing the fourth pad, I'm now controlling the auxiliary sends using the knobs along the top. And I press it once, I'm controlling send one where I've got a reverb unit. You can hear my drums getting more and more reverby there. 
and I can turn it down. And then if I hold down shift and press send again, I'll be sending to the second auxiliary send, which I've got set to a delay unit, which I may not have on for the drums. Oh, that's in my other project. So take my word for it. We'll look at that one in a minute. My apologies. Um, so back to send one. There's my reverb. Okay. So volumes, pans, sends, straight off the controller, no problem. And here's a really Cubase specific tie-in and one that I really like and I make great use of. Um, what I will do is we'll just chat for a moment while I load up my other project, which is easier to demonstrate this in. So for those of you who are Ableton users, you'll be familiar with Ableton's macro control methodology. Cubase has what's called quick controls, um, something that's perhaps not entirely dissimilar, a little bit different, but essentially means that there are eight immediately available slots onto on every channel in Cubase, um, and each of those slots houses what's called a quick control, something that can be assigned to any feature within, say, for example, a virtual instrument. And here is a virtual instrument now. Now, I, I will just explain that there is a, a little thing worth mentioning here. I'm using a combination of Cubase's built-in virtual instruments, which are outstanding, I must say, as well as some third-party stuff like uh, Mini Monster features again, and there's a bit of um, the Spitfire libraries in there as well. So anyway, with, with, before I talk too much more, let's just have a little look. So if I bring up my screen and throw the keyboard in the corner once again, here I've got Retrolog, um, a built-in polysynth in Cubase, and it's just a wonderful instrument except I've got it turned down, but easy fixed because I just grabbed the fader there. All right, and then I'll expand our quick controls here in the track inspector on the left of Cubase. And you can see here we've got the eight slots. So I have a slot. Now for the built-in Cubase instruments, for the Steinberg stuff, they've already obviously assigned these quick controls to the really useful everyday type stuff. So I'm going to, um, oh, I just need to quickly, before I do that, I'll just change away from there for a second. I just need to do a little tweak so that everything is running smooth. Pardon me one moment. Oh, I've got my plug-in in the way. Um, yeah, so being able to, the great strength of those quick controls is that whatever controller you have attached it can be a simple matter of just choosing a different track and then the continuous controllers, in this case our knobs, will automatically function with that track. So here we go. All right, so what were we looking at? We were on the retro log. And you can see the first one in the list here which Cubase have assigned very sen sensibly is the filter cutoff, which is your go knob on your synthesizer. So... I just got to change, sorry, to device mode. Pretty handy stuff. I think I have done some uh, panning there, erroneous panning, but that's okay. You will forgive me for that. Um, and I'm still in the wrong Cubase project, that's why it is. I'm sorry, I've really painted myself into a corner here. It'll only take a second to load up the correct one. You can look at me for a moment. Um, now, Cubase, okay, good. Um, so making use of those quick controls in a fluid and immediate way. Now, of course, we're not restricted to just using the knobs here. There's ultimate flexibility. And actually, the functionality between the faders and the knobs are pretty much entirely interchangeable. So if you prefer to control your volumes with your knobs, you can easily do that. It's just a matter of choosing volume there. Um, same for the faders. If you prefer using your faders for sends, then it's a matter of just choosing sends on the faders. So there's a great deal of flexibility in which controllers you can use for which features. Sometimes it's actually kind of useful to be able to do shots of delays on a fader um, quicker than you can do with a knob. 
Um, sometimes you can get a finer degree of resolution perhaps with the knob than you can with a fader. So, you know, horses for courses, everyone has their own workflow preferences and it's really, really cool that we're able to work however you wish to work with this thing. So there we go. You should be able to see my keyboard in the corner and let's grab a virtual instrument. All right, so here's Mini Monster. Well, let's do Retrolog again. That's right, that's a good choice because this is the one we're talking about. So you can see I've got my sound here. I'm gonna choose Shift, Device, so I've got my quick controls. You can see here I've got Cutoff in slot one, Resonance in slot two, Distortion, some envelope stuff and some um, Attack Decay and so on on the further knobs. But really it's all about just being able to make your software feel like a piece of hardware and not have to do any heavy programming to get to that point. So I mean, that's a wonderful thing for me. I feel like I'm playing a hardware synth. I haven't had to map anything. And that's a plugin that I use all of the time, just included with Cubase. Okay, let's say for example, I wanted to use a plugin that isn't a Steinberg native plugin. So here we have the venerable BX Oberhausen from Brainworks, um, a really, really great Oberheimy style plugin. And you can see I've assigned a couple of controls here already. Um, filter cutoff is in my first slot. So to show you the power of those quick controls, I just grab any track, uh, page over. If I grab my mini monster and oh, that one's not working for me. So, oh, there we go, sorry. If I play my mini monster, then the knob controls the cutoff on mini monster. Uh, if I go to oddity, then my knob controls that. So these quick controls are a really, really fantastic way to turn your controller into a chameleon and have it control whatever the software that you're using is. It doesn't matter what the software looks like. You can have a common methodology with your knobs like I do, which is knob one is pretty much always cut off, knob two is pretty much always resonance and so on. And implement that methodology the way that you like. Now, if I wanted to uh, add a different control, so I'll just bring up my Oberhausen again. So here's a great example. If I wanted to say, assign that oscillator pitch to a quick control knob, it's just a simple matter of choosing the slot, let's go with slot eight, and I can actually learn here. I can click learn, enable my learn mode, choose slot eight, which will be my eighth knob, and grab that, you know, turn the knob that I want to control uh, on the plugin, turn off my learn mode, and now it's done. And that assignment that I've created, again, this will all be available the moment. All I have to do is connect launch key to the computer and open Cubase. That will be there and this assignment will save with my project and is in fact portable between different projects if you so wish, or in my case, set it up as part of your template so that every time you load up Cubase, you know what the knobs are, uh, you know what they're assigned to and there's no extra work required from you. So there's our quick, quick control overview. Um, I'll just assign that back, bring that back down to zero so we don't have any nasty surprises with the tuning. All right, so uh, quick controls. Now those quick controls obviously don't exist purely on uh, MIDI tracks. They also exist on audio channels. If I, I do have an audio track here with a crash symbol on it, if we just, there's my crash symbol. Um, audio channels also have quick controls and all of the things. Same with effects channels, if here's my reverb. Um, there are quick controls available for every type of plugin or track in Cubase that you may wish. And so it's a brilliant way to, again, like I say, have that repeatability when every time I sit down to my project, I know I don't need to do anything to, uh, to have it working the way that I want. And that brings me to 
Another great feature of Launch Key, uh, one that I make use of all the time. Again, the, the Launch Key is the centerpiece controller of my studio at home. And Launch Key's custom modes are a really, really great way to make use of to be able to drive whatever else is in your studio without taking your hands off your main keyboard. So it can be a piece of hardware or it can be a piece of software. In my case, a great example here is any of the Spitfire instruments. And I would imagine that Spitfire plugins are probably pretty popular amongst the Cubase contingent out there. I have a custom, con uh, custom mode set up on my faders, custom mode four, which gives me control of the volume and expression controls on any Abu, uh, any Spitfire plugin straight away. Um, these always on any Spitfire and near any orchestral instrument. The channel volume here you can see going up and down will always respond to CC11 and your expression or your dynamics control will respond to CC1 or the mod wheel but it's pretty common to see those side by side in use by somebody when they're performing with these type of plugins so that I can go from my channel volumes, be mixing, and then jump onto my custom mode number four and be performing. Really, really, really great stuff. Now, in the past, I would have had to have a separate controller or some kind of complicated workaround, which would again involve taking my hands away from the keyboard. So for me, having instant control over this is remarkable. Similarly, for my Summit, which you can see hiding in the background over here, um, Summit can be sometimes a little bit out of reach, so I can't quite reach the thing, and I just want to make a bit of an adjustment to the filter. So I have a custom mode here on custom mode one, which lets me control the filter controls on Summit from here. Again, all the mapping gets done beforehand and I use those four slots to control whatever it is that's in my studio. All right, so that's sort of the high notes of the tactile controls. If we have a little look at some of the feedback you can get, and this is really, really handy, well, for people who aren't as colorblind as I am perhaps, but I, use, I do use track colors quite a bit. Um, perhaps with not the level of subtlety that some people may, but I will use big blocks of very obviously different colors to identify parts of my project. So here we've got our drums at the top. You can see I've got a, an NI battery there. Uh, we'll just give it a little solo. And I'll loop us up a section. So I might want my tr drums to be red. Good. Then I'll choose my next track and I might want my crash to be, well, I think that's yellow. And my third track, my bass line, I might wish that to be this color and track four, this color and track five, this color. I mean, I'm sure we're all pretty familiar with the idea of using track colors to identify what's going on in your project or group like things together. And what's really exciting, you may be able to see in that small shot in the corner, but if I just go to the zoomed in shot and I'll continue changing some track colors here, you will see that the track colors that I've selected have now been reflected across the pads. So for that brain to music connection to keep you away from reaching for the mouse and or keyboard at any time to be able to, you know, I'm, I'm quite used to counting in blocks of eight. Um, but if I look at this one and say, oh, there's my orange, or green, whatever it is, there's my red track, I know that it's there. Um, there's my yellow track, there's my blue track. So your track selections can be done and are reflected with the colors that you've chosen in your project. Pretty, pretty great stuff. Uh, and then similarly to that, if we just dip back into the quick control idea quickly, um, and again, you won't be able to see this from the camera angle that I have, and I apologize for that, but if you have a look at perhaps our little overview video uh, on our YouTube, you'll be able to see that Launch Key Mark III screen actually gives you real language feedback on what you're controlling. So here I'm controlling the cutoff knob. You can see my cutoff knob changing 
here on my plugin, this knob here, and it says filter cutoff on the screen with a numeric value all the way up to 22,000 because of the high level of resolution. So worth noting that we're also not entirely bound by the previous limitations of a MIDI mapping like this. So we have a high resolution control with the reflection on the screen. And that's real screen feedback is across all of the controls. With my panning, I can see it gives me, you know, it says R70 or it'll say L29 to reflect the level of panning that's been done, which is extremely handy if perhaps you don't have the mixer up on the screen. And if I just close our bottom panel, um, a realistic example of this could be if I'm doing some detailed drum editing. And here we are, and I'm moving my drum sections around and whatever, but I just need to pan that part. Well, I, it can be hard to have too many things up on the screen at the same time. If I can't see my pans, and but I need to see my MIDI, and I've got a complicated selection going on. Um, this is a quandary I often find myself in. I'll have a complex selection of many different notes or so on, and I don't want to close or step away from this because I'm deep at work um, to be able to grab a fader and adjust the volume of this track. So to bring the drums down or to pan the parts around, pretty handy stuff. Um, and beyond the meat and potato stuff, I'd put that one into the lifesaver category. Um, so we have covered the screen feedback. We've covered the quick controls and the track coloring. We've covered the basic level of nesting that's required to get between your stop solos, mutes and track arms. It's literally one button. Um, you will never have to go more than one layer deep or hold down the shift button for one layer of control. This is not a complicated mechanism to navigate. Again, I must emphasize this is the implementation that I'm playing with here, as it stands, even with the capture MIDI, things like that, is straight out of the box. You just connect, launch key to the computer, open Cubase, Cubase will see that launch key and will give it the integration that you want. Um, we covered the custom modes, extremely handy functionality there and something, like I say, that I make use of all the time. I already did, but having those custom modes built into Cubase is pretty remarkable. And the last thing we'll cover quickly is the inspirational features that are within Launch Key itself, which can be a great tool, regardless of whether you're an extremely accomplished musician or you're just starting out or you're just looking for a source of inspiration, Launch Key can go a long way to keeping you on rails. So for example, the scale modes, something that is a great tool to use just to keep things in key where So we're in a C minor scale there, and this has been covered by Calc in detail very wonderfully. But to be able to... I can't hit a wrong note, basically. So having the scale mode right there in the box is brilliant. Similarly, our uh, fixed chord mode is available right there. So if I just hold my chord down, and um, well, let's do this one for a, for a bit of flavor and I'll make sure I've got my device open so I can do some. So fixed chord is there. Fixed chord of course plays very nicely with the scale mode together so And then that MIDI can be recorded straight into Cubase. So we'll just throw a quick bit down. So it may not be the greatest piece of music ever, uh, but you can hear very quickly able to create fairly sophisticated complex chordal movements with just one finger and some random keys, thanks to the fixed chord and the scale mode 
plugging straight into Cubase. So we will just address the final one here of the inspirational features, our arpeggiator. Now, launch keys arpeggiator. I'm a bit of an arpeggiator kind of person. I love them. I think you can never have too much arpeggiator in everything. Having a brilliant arpeggiator built straight into the box here that records into Cubase is synchronized with Cubase from the get-go is pretty great. So I'll turn on my click track. We'll get things going. So I'm using my quick control for expression with the filter. We might latch the arpeggiator and I can start experimenting with different modes. And again, they will just, I've got a latch, turn off the latch, sorry. That arpeggiator, which is all the, all the MIDI driven by Launch Key Mark III, will just record straight into Cubase. So I hit my record button, get my count in three, four. And of course I don't even need to quantize it because it's already locked to the groove. And I can turn off my click. So now, finally, what we might do is just quickly use the features that we've covered so far to just throw together a little piece of music with as little intervention from the mouse and keyboard as possible. Something of a bit of a holy grail for somebody who is looking to get the ideas down as quickly as possible um, without veering off into spreadsheet land, which sometimes music software can feel like that. So let's just hit stop, stop, stop. I've got myself a four bar loop here. That's probably adequate for what we want to do. Um, you can see here, these are just some little ideas I was experimenting with before. Okay, there's one. There's another one. So just to show really how remarkably quick this can be. Let's turn on our click track and let's find that we're on the right drum channel. I'll choose my drums channel there. Okay. Sounds pretty good to me. Here we go. bit funny on the playing so just a couple of taps of the quantize key and we've quantized all right so I'll go to track three here with launch key where I've got my mini monster um, you'll see I'm not even bringing up the plugins I don't need to look at them I know that knob one is going to be my cutoff knob sounds good just record because it was a bit stronger and now we've got our retro log plugin so I select my retro log track with number four GeForce OBE, which has very quickly become my favorite plugin. Big Oberheim fan over here. Uh, this is a wonderful plugin. So we will just make sure I'm on my device. Sounds good. And back to the start. Let's just play through, have practice.
this H101 plug in here. I can hear it's a bit low. So it's just a matter of making sure my faders are set to volume. I can see this track here is the one that's selected, so I can just grab that fader and turn it up a bit. Uh, we have recorded that section, a couple of taps of the quantize key. So what shall we do next? We've got the SH2 here, which I can see is muted. So I just uh, unmute it. And Sounds like we need an arpeggiator there. Now, here we go. We just hit that arpeggiator button and we're off. Might go up an octave. All right, so let's just hit record while we're going. So I had left on the arpeggiator accidentally, but I love a happy accident. And just go to my SH2 quickly. Close that filter a bit. Sounding pretty good. So down here I've got Abbey Road 1. It's got some strings loaded. Go to my custom mode, which we discussed earlier. You can see now this one's control. All right, and record. And you can see that MIDI data has recorded straight in from my custom mode. I mean, this is really, really wonderful stuff. It gets me very, very hot under the collar to be able to just switch a couple of modes, go from one function to the other in the software that I know and love. This is unprecedented for a Cubase user like me. All right, we'll get rid of that. And I'll go back to my, whoop, still recording. Go back to my, what track have I got here? I've got the Oddity. I can hear is a little low, so just a matter of getting the fader. Okay, so I can just play my little solos on my instrument there, find the thing I'm happy with, or just jump into record. All right, and we've thrown that down. You can hear there's a bit of uh, off the grid stuff, a bit of glissando in there. So I just hit my quantize button once, it'll preserve the glissando to a degree. Maybe one more time, but then tidy up the notes that I really landed on a little bit out of time. I also love that character of it being duophonic, so you get the nice little bits of ring modulation when they play together. I'll just 
just grab my crash symbol over here. Maybe my little reverse crash for good sport. All right, so in what, five, seven minutes, we've thrown together something that approaches the really good beginning of a solid musical idea, and I didn't touch the mouse or keyboard, I will have you know. And now, you know, the, the uh, compositional process can often mean that the mix gets a bit unwieldy, so let's just, I'll bring up the mixer in Cubase here so that you can see exactly what we're about to do. I don't need to look at the project for this, so I'll go back to my start, and I'm just gonna bring all my faders down. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and then a couple more, we'll just keep the reverb up, and back to the top, so we hit play, get rid of that click track, we don't need it anymore, and now we can start pulling a little mix together. So as before, start with some drums. And you'll note actually you'll uh, in the previous project I didn't have, you'll see my two rows of sends here, I have reverb and delay. I didn't have delay in the other project. So one shift sends once, and I'm controlling auxiliary send one, shift sends again, I'm controlling auxiliary send two. And this is really elegant. I mean, it's always been a bit iffy with Cubase to find the best possible way to have access to your auxiliary sends and assign that to a controller uh, because you always had to do something fairly static unless you were, you know, using a Mackie control or the Huey uh, integration gave you something approaching usability. Um, but this is obviously quite a bit tighter quite a bit more repeatable. So we've done our drums, let's bring our, our crash cymbal up. Okay. And of course I've still got control over all my device settings here so I can be changing things around if I want to be controlling my filters. Alright, track four, we have our retro log. And our next track, OBE. Oh, I'm in record mode, we'll just get out of that quickly. Sorry, I was in right automation mode. Some automation that'll, that'll ruin my day. Maybe throw a bit of uh, lush effects on this guy. I want some delay on track one. We're on SH101. See, that needs a bit of reverb, so over to our sends. This is our selected track. Control the filter. Maybe a bit of delay. Great, let's ground that one in reverb. There's a theme here, you might note that I love a bit of reverb. Alright, and finally we 
have our strings. So I'll just bring the strings up, make sure to set them in the mix. So what we will just discuss for the very end is obviously, very obviously, I am using the Launch Key 49. All of this functionality is available across the entire Launch Key family, Launch Key Mark III family, I must stress. Launch Key Mini, Launch Key 37, Launch Key 25, Launch Key 49 and 61 all have this exact same functionality. So it doesn't matter about the keyframe size that you're working with. Um, you won't be punished for wanting a compact keyboard. And it's pretty remarkable that you get so much power within even Launch Key Mini with its tiny little footprint. Um, and obviously a lesser complement of controls, not having the faders and so on, but because the controls are pretty much entirely, well, entirely exchangeable between the knobs and the faders. That means that you're not excluded from having the functionality of the faders. You can just break your volumes out onto the knobs or so on. So it's a really, really wonderful thing. Um, I must say as a Cubase user, which I'm hoping there are a few more of you out there, um, this is a bit of a game changer to be able to have such flexibility, such power, such control um, and that general idea which for me it's all about brain to music to not have to be able to go for the dread mouse and keyboard keep your hands on the keyboard control your software have all of the inspirational features the arpeggiator the uh, scale modes the, the one finger chords the fixed chords mode to have all of the feedback coming back to me be able to see the colors of my tracks here control of the mixer, control of panning and volumes, the quick controls to make my software feel like hardware, um, the transport controls, all combine to make this a wonderful musical pairing and a great instrument itself. The combination of Cubase and Launch Key together are both sort of bigger than, the, than either of them. You know, the, the sum is bigger than the parts. Um, and I certainly must say I've gotten a huge amount of value from using it, I found my musical workflow to be smoother, more creative, more inspirational, less interruptions, less moving around my hands from one thing to another and making Cubase feel like a musical instrument. So in summing up, uh, we'll just have a quick look at the chat. Please integrate with Studio One. Uh, let's see, hey, anything's possible. Somebody's just ordered the Launch Key 37. Good on you, Phantom. You're going to absolutely love it. I'm a big fan of the 37 key myself. It's a, it's a brilliant frame size, and it's just big enough to be able, with my ho-hum keyboard skills, I can still get enough done with two hands, but it sits really nicely in one hand, um, giving you that extra octave to be able to go from, from what a 25 would offer, to be able to go from that sort of mid-range up to the high, which is where I spend half my life. Um, it's a brilliant keyboard and you're going to love it. So in summation, I've got to say thank you everybody for hanging out with us today. Uh, it's been really, really nice to have you here. It's been a privilege to be able to take you through Cubase and Launch Key Mark III and the brilliant new integration. And I hope you're as excited about it as I am. And feel free to uh, you know, get in touch with us if you have any questions about this or with your local music store. Uh, they'll be able to give you a bit of a hands-on demonstration and show you what it's all about. 
And for those of you who are thinking about checking out Cubase, I encourage you to do it and uh, to look at getting Launch Key Mark III connected up to Cubase 12 so that you too can have the wonderful experience that I've just had and showed to you. So thanks again. Thanks so much for joining us for this stream. And I look forward to catching you all next time. Have a great day.